Were Never Really Here is directed by Lynn Ramsey and stars Joaquin Phoenix as Joe, an ex-military veteran and uh, ex-FBI investigator or FBI agent. Joe lives alone with his mother. Uh, He's suffering from severe cases of PTSD and depression, and he works for a private company that uh, aims to uh, find young children that are kidnapped. His mission is to investigate the kidnapping of the daughter of a U.S. politician, uh, somebody who's running for governor or senator, or or who's the senator's running mate, somebody really high up in the New York political sphere. And so he goes to the place where uh, she is being kept. He manages to uh, flee with uh, the young daughter. And as they wait for the father to uh, come and... Uh, get his girl back, they learn via the news that he has been killed. I mean, it's officially a suicide, but you assume after everything that's gone on that he's been killed. And uh, all of a sudden, um, two police officers barge into this crappy motel room that they're staying in, and they take the girl and they attempt to kill uh, Joe. So because of the thematic elements and the plot elements, there have been a lot of comparisons that have been drawn to, and rightfully so, to uh, Martin Scorsese's 1976 film Taxi Driver. Uh, I will say, though, that the film is probably far more symbolic, far less straight in its narrative, uh, and really follows uh, something that could be conceived as artful exploitation. The film, uh, interestingly enough, does contain a lot of Christian imagery and symbolism. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix, with his big beard and his long hair, uh, kind of serves as this Jesus figure. Um, his tool of choice uh, for killing people is uh, a carpenter tool uh, because it, it's a hammer. You also have a scene in which the little girl that he's just rescued has a towel on her head. Uh, which uh, looks eerily like the veil uh, for the Virgin Mary, and uh, the camera really lingers on that shot for a little while, so it wants you to understand that there's something to this Christian imagery. Uh, And the film even has, uh, I think, two uh, resurrection sequences, so yeah, the film is deeply rooted in a lot of Christian symbolism. Uh, I should add that the first shot of the film is um, of Joe starting a fire in a room by lighting uh, what is presumably the only book that's found in a hotel room, which is the Bible. But yeah, he he takes a bin and he lights the the Holy Bible on fire. So the film is very much littered with symbolism, uh, Christian symbolism as we evoked, but also uh, Freudian symbolism. It really does play out like a sort of uh, Freudian dream or Freudian nightmare uh, that our main character Joe is going through. Um, I'm no specialist in uh, psychoanalysis and certainly not a specialist of Freud's uh, work, but, you know, things like him pointing his tooth out at one point or um, the whole rebirth scene in the water, uh, the last uh, sequence of the film takes place in this big house and houses, uh, as I understand it, are uh, really important in the interpretation of dreams, uh, according to Freud. So those elements combined with the editing and the way the film is shot, which is verging on hallucinatory at points, but not really going there fully. And just the fact that the film is called You Were Never Really Here, implying that is anything that we see really uh, true. Uh, It has us questioning reality. Are we seeing reality? Well, clearly not, considering a lot of what we see, because the film is told through Joe's eyes, and we get to sort of experience it in this warped, messed up, unstable way. Um, And yeah, the film leaves us with a lot of questions about reality. Now, considering the era this film is made in, the era uh, in which it's being released, and this probably says a lot more about me than it does about the actual film, but I was pulled out of the film quite a bit by the plot elements, and that is to say, seeing this Jesus-like figure trying to save uh, this young girl from a pedophile ring that involves uh, powerful politicians and you know corrupt officials, it read and it played sometimes like something um, you know, out of an Alex Jones rant on Infowars. And in this period of YouTube conspiracy theories, there was a point where it almost read like uh, 
Pizzagate fan fiction. And again, I don't think that's anything I should hold against the film, but it's certainly something that was uh, in my mind for a large chunk. And it certainly has to do with where I am now and the film being released now because in 2013 there was a film called Bastards directed by Claire Denis. And that film, um, I don't remember the exact details of the plot, but it also involved pedophilia and it involved powerful people taking advantage of these uh, child sex rings and whatnot. And all these conspiracy theory uh, elements didn't really pop into my head because at that time I really wasn't, not aware, but I really wasn't attuned to all the crazy shit that gets said online. And let me make this very clear, that's not to say that I don't think these things exist, they very clearly do. Uh, of course there are child sex rings, of course there are nasty people doing nasty things. And obviously I'm not saying you can't make a film about it, nor should you. Now Lynn Ramsey's from the UK, and obviously that country has been shaken to the core by uh, the revelations into, you know, Jimmy Savile, who was one of the biggest entertainers uh, in Great Britain for the longest time. And, uh, I don't know, if you want to do some research on Jimmy Savile and the BBC, and it, it's just the most disgusting, horrible uh, stories you will read. And uh, there are also these um, rumors, these theories uh, going around about the fact that we don't know everything yet, and it goes higher up. And I, I don't know much about that, to tell you the truth, even in my country, France. There are rumors about these sorts of things involving politicians, but since I've never found anything out on something that I would call a credible source, it's, it's not something I, I, I entertain. Now, this film really does have a lot to unpack. Um, it's not very concerned about giving you information. Like I said, you are seeing the world through uh, Joaquin Phoenix's eyes, and he's not the most stable of individuals. Um, I was thinking maybe there's some things that I missed in terms of the dialogue, uh, especially in one scene because it was so, like, mumbled that it wasn't very clear what uh, was being said. So again, maybe I missed some things, and I know that in terms of the imagery of the symbolism of the Freudian uh, dreamlike interpretations that are possible, I I've missed and probably forgotten a lot by now. It is an incredibly well shot, uh, incredibly well-directed film. Joaquin Phoenix is just just one of the greatest actors living today. I think that out of the gate, that's what made this project so exciting. You have Lynn Ramsey, who's one of the most exciting directors working today, who has only made four films in the last 20 years, so when she does release a film, it feels like an event. And you add, you know, Joaquin Phoenix, who's quite possibly the greatest actor of his generation, uh, one of the greatest working actors. You just shoot a film with him looking out a window silently or driving a car and immediately he has 99% more presence than any working actor, any actor giving, you know, a career best performance. He is just an icon. He is an institution at this point. Uh, Johnny Greenwood does the score as he did in We Need to Talk About Kevin, I believe. And he also re very recently did the score to uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's Phantom Thread. He works a lot with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson as well. The score is excellent. In terms of the direction, Lynn Ramsey does some really creative things in terms of trying to not show too much graphic violence. So, for example, you have one scene where Joaquin Phoenix is basically raiding um, the pedophile lair or whatever you want to call it and it's all shot um, like security cam footage so you have the camera moving uh, from side to side as if it's uh, panning across the the room surveilling um, and it's quickly editing uh, all the cameras together so you're seeing fragments of the violence and the film is uh, generally more concerned about showing the aftermath of violence uh, rather than uh, the violence itself so it's very clear that on a technical sense, you know, we're in very good hands. Uh, we've got some really talented people that are working behind the scenes and in front of the camera. There are also some jarring elements to the film, and one is, you know, the conspiracy thing. I already talked about it, but um, another one that really sticked out in my mind and that really... I, I, I can't stop thinking about that leaves a really bad taste in my mouth is the sequence just after Joaquin Phoenix frees the little girl from the um, sex dungeon. They're in the car and uh, they're driving away and uh, going wherever. 
and she is in the car in the passenger seat. She is looking out the window. The, the shot is like a, a close-up of her face uh, of the window, and she's like touching the window, um, and she's counting to herself. This motif of people counting to themselves is very important. Uh, it's um, repeated several times through the film. Um, I guess it has to do with the idea of coping, like she counts before something really traumatic is about to happen, so when Joaquin Phoenix discovers her, she's counting backwards, and that's something that Joaquin Phoenix does as well. The film opens by him and the voice of the little girl also counting backwards, and then later on when he's uh, really depressed, almost, uh, you know, on the verge of suicide, is counting backwards as well, so there's the whole, you know, trauma, PTSD aspect uh, to it in those two characters, uh, and its presence in that scene. Sorry, I went on kind of a huge tangent, but when she's in that scene in the car, uh, her hand on the um, window, and she's counting backwards, so you have this little blonde girl counting backwards, and, and at that moment, the piece that is playing, the, the piece of the score by Johnny Greenwood is kind of really weird. I couldn't describe it properly, but it's very strange. It doesn't fit the scene at all. And you see this little blonde girl, you know, looking out this window, and there's rain coming across the window, and she's counting backwards, and, you know, you've got this music that doesn't fit at all, and, and this whole scene is really weird and twee, and it felt like I was watching, like, a Sia music video or something. It felt completely out of place, and actually kind of distasteful, uh, considering the tone of the film, considering what we'd just seen previously, and in, in that, I cannot shake that sequence from my mind, because I think it's terrible. Um, it's very short, though, so it's, it's clearly not the majority of the film. And like I said, I'd like to see this film a second time for sure, just to get a better understanding of my own feelings towards it, because I gotta say that, um, yeah, I'm not really sure which way I lean on the film, to be honest. I mean, I can recognize that there are some really tremendous uh, technical and, and acting and, and artistic aspects, and then there are others that eh, I could really do without or that really bothered me. So uh, I think a second viewing would be for the best. Uh, so when it hits Prime... Uh, I'll definitely check it out at that point. Um, and this allows me to segue a little bit onto Amazon because the film is being released through Amazon. And because we're a couple days removed from the whole uh, Netflix uh, versus can sort of controversy, I just wanted to say that, man, Amazon are really doing this thing right. You can have the theatrical experience. They're not pissing off theater owners. They're not pissing off uh, festivals. And if you want to pay, you know, whatever price to go see it uh, in those conditions, then you can do that. And if you don't, well, you can wait for three, four months, and then you can see it on streaming. And I think that is the ideal solution. And I sort of understand why Netflix don't want to do that. Their whole business model is don't go to the theater, you know, uh, stay at home, watch Netflix. But I, I think the way Prime does it is for sure uh, the way that I prefer. Cleary said you were brutal. I can be. So thank you very much for watching the video. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please hit the like button. And if you would consider subscribing, that'd be great if you haven't already. And until next time, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.